Hi, for this episode's feature, I wanted to talk about the weekend VHF-UHF transceiver kit. This transceiver kit uh, was donated to the ICQ podcast by Mr. Richard Pazina, G8ITB. Uh, Richard turned up at the club and he said, Martin, is this any use uh, for you guys to do something with? And effectively, we decided to build it as a project for the ICQ podcast. This is an unbiased review of the weekend radio project kit built by myself, Martin Butler, M1MRB slash W9ICQ. I outline my findings and results in the conclusions at the end of this uh, video. The kit is based around a DR818U UHF band voice transceiver module which you control with a microcontroller. This kit is built around the DR818U UHF band voice transceiver controller and as I said before is uh, controlled by a microcontroller. The output power of this uh, radio can either be 0.5 of a watt or 1 watt depending on the jumper setting that you do on the main PCB. I have looked at the functional diagram and for those of you listening voice only uh, it is available if you look up the DR818 you uh, on the internet you can get a data sheet which shows you the different pinouts for this particular module now this particular module is about two inches by one inch by quarter of an inch high and it's pretty much a transceiver in its own right it just needs the controlling circuitry around it so moving on the documentation. Richard, when he gave it to me, gave me the links to the documentation that he'd uh, been sent. You download the files off the internet and they give you some instructions on how to build it and how to uh, operate the radio. Now, interestingly enough, uh, in the package was a small slip of paper with about three lines of uh, changes to some of the components saying one thing changes to another. And uh, that was uh, certainly helpful because when you start looking for components, you've uh, had a bit of a problem. I downloaded the uh, the instructions and what way we went. Now, when I unboxed it, and I didn't uh, record a video of unboxing, but when I unboxed it, the components were good quality components. Let's be brutally honest about it. I've uh, taken a picture for the video, although you guys listening audio can't see this. There were a couple of extra bits Richard had put in with the kit, so I had some extra bits, which rather threw me for a few seconds. But uh, once worked out what he'd been up to, that wasn't too much of a problem. Looking at the circuit diagram, and, and for those of you who are listening audio, I'll explain it. The circuit diagram is kind of been drawn modular. So for argument's sake, each individual section is drawn separately and then on, on the sheet of A4, and then the interconnecting leads are obviously are marked with labels saying which lead goes to where. Now, the radio itself uses an LM386 as an audio amplifier, which is uh, perfectly acceptable. It has a mute circuit on the audio amplifier, so when you're going to transmit, it all mutes the uh, audio from the receiver, uh, the audio amplifier. There's another part of the circuit that um, used for display. Now that's driven from the microcontroller, but they actually use a Nokia old Nokia phone display, which works very very well. As I said, the uh, RF module, the DRA818U, has circuitry around it uh, with with the PA uh, coming straight out of that module through a low pass filter and the microphone input circuit uh, going into it. Uh, there's also a section showing the uh, connections around the microcontroller. Uh, connections on how the power supply works and the rotary encoder for obviously changing channel. Now one thing I looked at very strange is for the power supply. The power supply is runs off 13.8 uh, volts as we'd expect. Looking at it, it has a 5 volt regulator 
and uh, I would guess it was a 1 amp 5 volt regulator. Now, from the 13.8 volts, it goes through four diodes. So obviously you're looking at getting about a 2.4 volt drop across those uh, silicon diodes before you go to the uh, input of the 5 volt regulator. Now I thought the 5 volt regulator could have handled straight in at uh, 13.8 volts, but uh, nevertheless. And the far side of the power supply, the 5 volt rail comes out goes through another diode and a choke and effectively you end up with 4.2 volts HT or voltage uh, which the whole unit works on. As I say, I understand that uh, a number of you can't see this because uh, you're listening audio. The printed circuit board, very nicely made printed circuit board. The top side is silk screened and it has the labels of where each component goes, uh, nicely silk screened, and their values. And for the most part, uh, you can just build it off that. Uh, there are a few changes because if you're building the VHF module or the UHF module, you ha would obviously have to change some of the components. The downside is there is no instructions for putting this together. So you really are reliant on this silk screen uh, layout on the board as to where all the components go. But uh, more on that later. Moving on, the rear of the printed circuit board is very well made as well. So it's a double-sided board, a very clean and tidy layout, which is quite impressive. And uh, let's say a nicely manufactured PCB. It took me a little while because I don't rush these things and I suppose the most difficult part was uh, soldering on the uh, DR8818U uh, module onto the printed circuit board. You uh, solder it to the top like a surface mount, big surface mount device. The rest of the components are through hole and uh, you have an LED to show whether you're high power or low power. As I say, once again, that's inside the unit, so you pretty much uh, set it up once and leave it. Uh, the ICs are socketed, the uh, microcontroller is socketed into the board, along with the LM386. So, uh, very well, well put together and quality of components. The front panel, you end up uh, assembling a, a volume control onto it. The rotary controller, a dual color LED, red and green, the microphone socket, and the display module, as I said, which is a Nokia phone uh, panel, uh, which uh, is very, very useful. Now, when you come to put this together, as I say, with the documentation, all it gives you is these were a picture of the printed circuit board and a picture of where the wires all go. So you have to follow them through. You have to keep your wits about you and make sure you wire it correctly. Now, the way they show the speaker being connected, they show the loudspeaker being connected to the board and they also show a loudspeaker socket in parallel with the actual speaker. Now, I think that is a mistake. I think that what they really intended to do is have it to break the circuit so that uh, when you plug an external speaker in, it disables the internal, little internal speaker. But uh, the way they're showing you to wire it, it isn't wired that way. So if uh, you're expecting an 8 ohm impedance and your speaker's an 8 ohm and you put another 8 ohm in there, you've got a 4 ohm impedance and uh, it might uh, make the chip, uh, the LM386, do some funny things. Haven't tried that, but we'll see. Uh, the front panel... Very clean and nice. Um, it, the left hand side is the volume control. In the middle, you've got the display, uh, so you can see what's going on. The one I have says VHF, UHF, RTX on the top, above the display. And when Richard bought it, he uh, had the front panel engraved with his call sign GAITB. To the right of the uh, display, you have the uh, frequency. Uh, adjuster which is which is the rotary controller and the dual color led and the microphone input socket 
Now, interestingly enough, I thought that the uh, LED would grow green when it saw a signal and red when it's in transmit. It turns out it's green all the time it's in receive, whether it's got a signal or not. So uh, that, uh, that threw me for just a few seconds. But, you know, it's uh, because of the information is in the documentation, you wasn't sure what to expect there. The front panel say very, very uh, good. It assembles into quite a nice case. The, the case is probably, in fairness, one of the better parts of the whole thing. The only thing I felt is when you pick it up, it feels very, very light. doesn't feel quality. Now, that's not the problem of the case. It's just you expect it to be really heavy, and this kit isn't. So, uh, going forward with that. The interconnecting wires, in my opinion, uh, were far too short. When you come to wire it up, and fit the board into the case you, you fit the pcb in the bottom of the case you fit the front and back panels the interconnecting wires some of them were too short and i had to uh, remove the ones supplied and fit longer ones uh, to be able to use it and at the moment uh, the speaker is on a longer wire of its own and uh, stuck to the inside the cabinet at the moment for testing purposes so a little bit disappointed on the length of the leads. They weren't long enough, and if you were trying to do this on your own, you could get well and truly uh, stuck. However, uh, because the leads are so short, you're kind of stuck because you're trying to dress the cables to make it look nice, and I just couldn't get it to, to look nice. I tried cable tying bits together to try and improve it, um, but it's still didn't look pretty inside uh, with the cables now you could say that's my fault because i didn't build it properly well, i'm going to put my hand up for that that's the best i could do and as i say i would have liked to have seen cables laid better and slightly longer unfortunately uh, my unit that i was building had a 40 dra 818u module and uh, lucky for me Richard, when he'd uh, purchased the kit, decided to purchase uh, a couple of these modules, so I had a spare one to fit in. But without it, I'd have been absolutely snookered. Um, yeah, I could have bought one, but I think it was disappointing that the one I had was, was 40. I don't believe I blew it up, but I, I have to be honest about it, I could have done. Now, I did take the uh, unit apart, and as I said, it's about two inches long by about uh, an inch uh, wide and probably about a quarter of an inch high. And for those of you who are going to uh, look at this video, the, uh, the, I, I took the lid off and you can see inside. And there's quite a bit inside it. There's a couple of big chips and uh, in the power transistor. What looks to be like a button uh, in the unit is uh, looks like a button or a battery is actually the heat sink for the uh, the pa which is quite interesting but uh, yeah we got it working in the end uh, that and a couple of other silly little issues in the documentation and we got it working so going to the conclusions well what are my conclusions on this kit well i think the worst thing about this kit was a very 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 poor documentation uh, I'm sorry, the, the documentation just let the whole thing down. The interconnecting cables for the kit are far too short. You know, a f an inch or so more would have made this uh, that, that problem go away. The parts recommended for a couple of modifications in the documentation weren't supplied. So the documentation spent more about to these modifications for stopping it staying in transmit if you use a rubber duck with it or uh, a couple of uh, capacitors across the microphone cables they took more, talked more about that than they really did about building the building the radio which i felt was quite strange and then they didn't supply the kit now mine didn't work first time and i probably spent a fair amount of time fault finding it because you don't want to rip out one of these uh, expensive modules just for the sake of it. You want to be dead sure when you do it that that's the problem. But uh, as I say, turned out to be that. 
a little bit disappointed in work first time. This is not a kit for a beginner. You would not suggest to, to sit down and do a build-a-thon with this with a group of newbies. Uh, there's just no way they could build this. If you haven't built any kits before, you would really struggle. Performance testing on air was okay. You know, I only tested it on air. I didn't put any test equipment on it. It seemed okay. But the downside is, with all this, when I'm being honest about it, this radio has less functionality than a Balfang UV3R. Yes, you heard me right, the 3R, the original little baby 1 watt uh, transceiver, uh, has more functionality than, than this kit. While most of us uh, would not be able to design and produce a kit like this, and it's easy to find fault with it afterwards, the radio menus system is uh, a little bit finicky and takes a bit of getting used to. It's uh, not intuitive in my opinion, but uh, you learn radio menu system, so that uh, could have been better. Now, this could be a good kit with the issues listed before fixed. However, you wouldn't build this kit to save money. I don't know how much Richard paid for it, but I'm sure you could pick up a UV3R, Belfong UV3R, for a lot less money than this kit. And uh, you've got more functionality. So, in conclusion, interesting piece of kit to build. Yes, it gave me a few headaches. Yeah, I had fun building it. Cost effectively? Not really. And uh, all in all, if the documentation was better, I'd give it much higher marks. But I'd probably only give this kit a, a 2 out of 10 because the documentation let it down. I'm sorry to say that. So hopefully this was a fair and honest uh, opinion of mine. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel if uh, you like what you see and gives us a thumbs up. Once again, the ICQ podcast is a fortnightly audio podcast on amateur slash ham radio, and we've been doing it since July 2008. And uh, website uh, is www.icqpodcast.com where you can get more information. So all's left for me to do now is say 73s from M1MRB slash W9ICQ. 